Hi, today I want to talk about kids, having kids or not, because there is a realistic chance that I'm never going to have kids myself, which is a bit of a tough realization to have, I guess, or it's definitely one of the key decisions in life, which can be very difficult and it's very difficult to know if it's the correct decision and maybe there is no correct and incorrect but I would like to gain some more clarity myself if this is really what I want for my life and I thought I would share my thoughts as well because maybe you're in a similar situation or you just are interested in what my thoughts are because uh, many of my friends from high school and university are having kids now and it's interesting having calls with them or being on Zoom and you see the little kids running around and also marriages happen more often and yeah it becomes a bit tough or uh, because of our innate social conditioning we of course right away think why don't I have kids and is something wrong with me maybe but one thing's for sure, and you maybe saw the headlines as well, that the U.S. has record low uh, birth rates right now. It's, I think, 1.9 or 1.7 or something, which is below replacement, right? In Germany, it's even lower. It's 1.7 or so. And uh, a big chunk of that is not actually German women, but uh, migrant women. There's studies about that. And Japan isn't that far off, it's like 1.6 or something, which I think there's a prediction. I read that Japan is going to only have half of its population. Now it's at 103 million. And by 2100 or so, the population is likely going to be 50 million. Which on the one hand is good, right? Maybe then cities like Tokyo are not going to be that populated anymore. But on the other hand, one has to ask what the implications are going to be for politics, for the economy, for our retirement, and many, many other things. But I'm not really that much going to focus on the big picture, on the economy. I'm more going to focus on the individual perspective, because that's very interesting to me. And also a bit on the, uh, with a focus on finding calm, on how to do it when you have a bit of a different brain and personality that likes quiet, that is more introvert by nature and so on. But I'm also going to consider some other things. And the second thing that kind of sparked my interest was a quote I heard by Jordan Peterson. Here it is. And well, why would you have children? It's like, that's a stupid question. It's like, well, what else are you going to do? And you have to be honest, my first reaction was, I don't think it's a stupid question. I don't think it's a stupid question at all. I think there are no stupid questions, really. Um, but I think it's quite anachronistic to say it's stupid to even think about having kids. We don't live in the 1600s anymore where you would have six or eight or nine kids and women were just birth machines. And it was just obvious to have tons of kids, right, for your own survival. I think it's weird to say that it's a stupid question because I think probably a hundred years ago you would say it's a stupid question to ask whether you should go to war. It's just your duty or it's your duty as a, as a woman to just get all these kids. Or also they would say probably it's a stupid question whether women should be able to vote no is the answer is what they would say so i personally don't think it's a stupid question at all i know very well that this topic is very touchy and dicey because so many things go into it like if you have kids yourself you probably don't even want to entertain the thoughts of whether this was the right uh, decision there's religion playing into it very heavily there's politics there's economy there's um, ethics, there's environmental factors and so on, so it's very difficult and uh, there are a lot of couples who want to have kids, a lot, very much so, but they can't. 
And then there are couples who have kids and maybe aren't are kind of depressed about it and think it's, it's too much for me. So it's a very dicey topic and I'm trying to consider everything uh, just from an abstract perspective. And if you feel offended at any point, I'm sorry, it's definitely not my intention. Uh, what I can say is that I think I'm kind of in a unique position because I'm in neither fraction. I'm not in the pro-kids fraction like you. It's your duty to have kids. But I'm also not in the anti-kids fraction in that I say, I can't bring a kid into this world. It's too bad and the environment and it's too expensive or whatever. So I'm kind of in between. I definitely see both sides. And also, I would say, um, I don't really know how it is to be to, to have kids because I don't have any. I think I'm in intelligent enough and wise enough to say the correct answer is likely I don't know. And this is an important fact that I'm going to talk about later too. I think personally, I really like kids. I think for me, it's very effortless to hang out with kids, to play with them all day. My little brother is like eight years younger than me and I kind of raised him and um, I think I can easily do this. I could easily be a stay-at-home dad. I think this is very much my natural propensity. But then again, there are also factors in me that speak against me having kids like my hypersensitivity, my me needing a lot of privacy and so on. And I'm going to talk more about this as well. So I'm kind of in a unique position and this is why I think or I hope I can make a more or less unbiased um, pros and cons list, but of course it's not going to be unbiased, right? And what I can say is I've been reading quite a bit online and on Reddit and so on about aspects like religion, but then also um, regretting motherhood or regretting parenthood, which has been kind of like a trend recently, some mothers coming out and saying, I don't even enjoy being a mother that much. And uh, it's very taboo to talk about it, obviously. And also there are subreddits called like Child Free, which are pretty much an echo chamber of being annoyed by kids. And at the same time, I do feel that they have uh, legitimate points that they raise too about their parents always nagging them about having kids or why do I have to take care of my, my, my neighbor's kids and so on? And I think it's very good that we talk openly about these things. But we have to also consider humanity and um, many other factors. It's a very complex topic. That's why it's interesting to me. And I would say, let's start. Uh, and I thought in this video, I would talk pretty freely. But then again, what I generally do when I have to make difficult decisions in life, I do the good old pro, pros and cons list. And so I thought, me being kind of egoistical, I guess in this case, I want to make a pros and cons list, even though you could technically say this isn't something you should make a pros and cons list about. Why not try it at least? And this is why I would say, let's start. All right, I have my little book here and I'm gonna with the pros. Number one, I would say, is lineage and genes and continue your family name and so on. I think that's kind of a 
egoistical reason, but it's very valid. Because you could say, what's the actual biological purpose of humans? To reproduce, to have kids, right? And uh, it is our main motivator from a biological perspective to be born, to have kids. And uh, just like any life form, our purpose, biologically speaking, is to reproduce and to not die off, okay? And I think it's valid and legitimate to say, hey, I kind of want to continue my family. I want to pass on my name. I don't want my family name to die off. And I kind of like my genes and I want them to continue being in the gene pool of this world. And this is why I want to have kids. I want to kind of have mini me's running around that will be kind of fun. And that's probably the primary reason why a lot of people have kids. And there's definitely like a biological urge to have kids, right? Uh, there is a thing like baby rabies and uh, women might have that a bit stronger, but men have that too in many cases. And I think it's also legitimate to say, I want to build something uh, that future generations can profit off of as well. Like I have this beautiful house that I worked hard for. I want my kids to be able to live in this house. And I want them to have a better life than me. And I want them to be able to influence the future. So I think this is a quite legitimate reason to say, I want my genes to continue existing. And in a way, I want to become in a way immortal because a small part of me, namely my DNA, will continue living in many, many generations in the future. So yeah. All right, number two. Kids being able to take care of you. This is probably the most egoistical reason, but it's, it's reasonable, right? Uh, who's going to take care of you if you're old and frail, if you're in a home or if you're still at home? Uh, it's likely going to be your kids. I think it's quite egoistical to say I'm bringing life into this world so they can take care of me eventually. But it's also, I would say, legitimate, especially in poorer parts of this world where there isn't really a social security system, where you don't have good nursery homes and so on, where you don't have a lot of money to expect your kids to pay back the gratitude that they have and kind of take care of you. And uh, I think for many people, the idea of being in an old people home, in a nursery home or whatever, uh, and them being surrounded by people who don't really like them and being treated like just a patient, like just an, a client, uh, is kind of scary. And I, I can empathize with that. And the idea of having your own kids loving you, maybe even uh, which is what my family kind of did, taking the old people in your own home, having them live with you, taking care of them, doing the best you can. I think this is a nice idea. And even though I kind of think it's somewhat egoistical, I think it's reasonable. All right, number three. Yeah, number three, I would say, is the idea of having a family life, of having this, and this is probably one of the primary reasons why people crave the, to, to have kids. They want to have this feeling of, of warmth, of harmony, of maybe sitting together at the dinner table, having a barbecue, having a nice meal, uh, watching a film together, laughing together, going on vacation together, creating memories together, because just creating memories on your own is maybe less nice than shared memories. And the idea of being able to share memories with your kids, creating unique relationships and memories with your kids together is very enticing to people, right? This warmth that people experienced in their childhood is something they want to recreate as adults. and. They want to have this family unit again, this kind of 
we stick together and blood is thicker than just friendship or whatever. All right. Then number four, I would say, Yeah, I get it. This is a pretty egoistical argument again, but it's very relevant to many people. Making your parents, i.e. the grandparents, proud or making the wider family proud, right? I think in many more traditional societies, uh, doing what your parents expect of you is, 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 is very, it's very strong force, right? You want to do what your parents, uh, you want to make your parents happy too. And in many families, the parents want to have grandchildren. So why not make them happy? You can also make the grandparents take care of the kids then. But I think it's also reasonable to basically get kids and to give kids the joy and benefit of having grandparents too, so not having them too late. So doing what your family wants from you, making them happy, making your aging parents and uncles and whatever else happy as well all right number five is maybe again a bit egoistical or whatever but I think it's a very strong force as well. What I talked about initially, many of my friends now have kids. And the idea of just being able to have play dates with them, being able to meet up and being able to have a common ground when talking to them, because being a dad is very different to just being high school friends, right? You can bond over the shared experience of raising a kid. You can laugh about the quirks of your kids. And at some point it feels like there are certain social groups that form over having kids. And if you're the one family or couple that doesn't have kids, it's almost like you don't get in touch with those people. And maybe also it can be a nice opportunity if, if your kid is a bit older, you can meet other parents, you can build friendships with other fathers. And uh, yeah, just basically the idea of, hey, my friends have kids, I want to have kids too, so they can play together and so, so that I can really bond with them more closely as fathers and mothers. Maybe you could say that's BS, but I think it's, it's also legitimate and reasonable in a way. All right. This to me is one of the key reasons and I think not so egoistical anymore. To become a better person. And yes, I do think that one can become a better person when having kids. I think it's quite rare that you make like a 180 degree change in your personality, that you have been an asshole before, a sadist, who now suddenly becomes an, a saint after having kids. But I've read enough books and records of newly found parents, new parents who basically say having a kid ch changed everything. I gained new purpose in life. I now have somebody to take care of. I'm no longer the number one priority in my life. It's not also self-centric. Now my kids are my number one priority. Um, this self focus has been transcended into a other's focus, which I think can be very healthy in our very individualistic society where we are way too much focused on our own well-being in many cases. I think, I think there's definitely a case to be made that we're hyper focused on our own mood, which coincidentally 
ironically, can make us very unhappy because being hyper-focused on our own happiness can make us miserable. Because it almost seems like we humans are designed to be others-focused. And many people find their fulfillment. I mean, you can have that too when you have religion and you can have uh, adopt children as well. But having your own flesh and blood in front of you, looking at you and being completely dependent upon you, I think this really awakens something that is inexplicable. That's what parents say. They say, I can't really put it into words. And I definitely believe that many positive traits also in men can be awakened, like a playfulness, a, um, a willingness to provide. And many men actually say they worked really hard in their careers after, being, uh, after having kids because now they feel like, hey, I have some fire under my ass because now I got to provide for this being that I brought into this life. This willingness to take on responsibility can then basically create a domino effect possibly and you're more willing to ha help other people and to help your parents, to help, uh, I don't know, homeless, to use this newfound energy and positive humanity for other good causes. So I think maybe this is egoistical too, but in a way everybody benefits from you becoming a better human, a more peaceful human, a more loving human, maybe even learning to love for the first time. I haven't experienced it yet, but I think it's very reasonable to say this is likely and possibly going to happen if you're becoming a parent. All right. Number seven. Okay, number seven to me is a very important one as well, and it's kind of linked to the one before, but I want to emphasize this idea of gaining this childlike joy and passion again, because I feel that this is one of the most unfortunate byproducts of getting older you become kind of used to everything. Everything kind of loses its color, its intensity, its joy. I mean, for, for myself, for instance, I can remember as a kid playing a video game, how much joy I felt, how much intensity I felt. And now I don't really have that anymore. I don't have that for most things in life. Uh, it, it's hard to really find things that you have like a hundred percent joy and, and, and enjoyment from, right? Everything becomes kind of stale and predictable and boring because you kind of did it already, right? It's very hard to really have that a hundred percent passion and, and, and joy again. Because as a kid, everything is new. There's so many firsts as a kid, right? Your first, the first time you see the beach, the first time you see animals, the first time you eat ice cream. And if you have kids, I think you can vicariously live through your kids in the sense that you can rediscover this passion, rediscover this love of life, rediscover this seeing something and your eyes lighting up and being full of joy and full of passion. I think unless you have a heart out of stone, you're gonna have some of this color coming back to you. In Germany we say, es wird abfärben. This color is gonna get to you in a sense. And maybe that's egoistical too, but I think it's something beautiful that if you have this one creature that means the world to you, and you see this creature experiencing pure, innocent joy, this is gonna fill up your heart as well. I'm quite certain of it. At least I, uh, this is what parents tell me. And I think this is one of the reasons why being a, tarant, a parent can be so fulfilling and can be so rewarding uh, despite all the pain in the ass that being a parent will cause you, for sure. All right. one's very important to me. Curiosity. 
and you might think what the hell this doesn't have anything to do in this list but to me being on this earth I would say maybe my primary purpose on this earth is to just experience life with all its ups and downs with the love with the death with the pain with the suffering with the joy and you could very well make the case that if you didn't have kids ever or maybe care for something or for someone purely and intensely like this you didn't really experience the full breadth of life okay the reality is i don't know what it's like to have a kid to have somebody who you kind of created in part or who you just chose to take care of okay i'm going to include uh, adopting kids here i just don't know how it is like okay and i think I can read as much as I want about it and talk to as many parents as I want about it. I'm never going to be fully able to grasp the breadth of it unless I experience it, okay? And I gotta admit, I'm just curious about it. I just want to experience life because I'm very honest in saying, I don't know. And I'm a very curious person. I'm very high in openness, you would say, if you look at the big five personality traits. And this is why I think I want to just experience life and this is a part of life that if I don't experience it I can never really say this is something I, I hate and that is too overwhelming because I just don't know okay I think it can be endlessly fascinating to have a small being that uh, is there and that you see growing up that you see their individual quirks uh, their personality which can be very unique and very different from you Maybe you see some similarities to you. Maybe you see their mother. Maybe you don't see any of it. But just seeing this life form um, that you undoubtedly or hopefully care for grow up, I think is just very, I'm just curious, like from a pure <laughs> intellectual perspective, but also from an emotional perspective. I'm curious of what emotions I'm capable of feeling. Okay, that's probably the crux of it. I'm curious of what emotions I'm capable of feeling, but also I'm curious about this being and how it's going to develop and how maybe I'm going to feel pain that I never felt before. That's very much possible as well. But maybe to me, that's the biggest reason. I want to experience life. I'm very open. I'm very open to saying, I don't know what it's like. And this is why maybe I haven't lived fully if I didn't experience this. It's possible. Why did I write this somewhere in the middle? Okay, here it is. All right, so turn this around. All right. Yeah, number nine is important. The idea or the hope that I'm going to be able to raise my kids better than I was raised. And I don't want to imply that I was raised terribly, but there's always room for improvement, right? And the idea that you can use what you've learned so far, be a great parent, be a great caretaker is, is very important, I think. And to me, also one of the primary reasons and appeals. Because I do, I am quite confident that I would be a good dad. Not a perfect dad, of course, but a good dad. I did read books about how to raise children and there's different philosophies. There's the uh, tiger mommy philosophy on the one end about really making, raising your kid, educating it in a very strict manner. And then there's the just love your kid philo philosophy. I think I'm kind of in the middle, more on the just love your kid unconditionally side. But I do acknowledge that you have to do some raising and let's say training in a bad, it's a bad word, but you have to kind of train your kid in a way that other kids are not going to hate your kid. I think that's an important point. And this is one point where I would agree with Jordan Peterson, even though I think he's a bit more authoritarian. I think most parents fail terribly at raising their kids in a loving manner accepting them how they are, being compassionate, taking time for them, really listening to them, but not trying to imprint their own life philosophy into them. 
and the idea of being able to be caring and loving and still maybe nudging them in a direction where you think life, a good and content life could lie, is it, beautiful to me. And I think I'm quite confident that I could be doing it better than my parents and a lot of parents. I know it's a tough job. I think it can just be so beautiful to also just help out your kid uh, with its problem, but not be overbearing, uh, accept your kid being loving. And I'm very willing to, to, to work on myself to be a better dad and to learn in this regard. So yeah, that's a, a very important aspect of it. All right, and then number 10. And this is definitely an important point. I think society needs good kids. Uh, maybe society doesn't necessarily need billions and billions of additional kids, but probably it's still going to happen. But I think from a pure perspective of, hey, I want this country and this continent and this world to be a better place in the future. What's the one thing I can do? Raise good kids who are in turn gonna raise good kids, who are maybe in turn gonna raise good kids. And then eventually maybe I created a lineage of great kids who maybe in the future uh, invented a cure for cancer or who went to Mars or who uh, didn't do any of this, who lived very unspectacular lives, but who are just good mothers and fathers or partners or caretakers. I think this is a good idea. I think there's definitely some truth to the fear of the future becoming like idiocracy, like the people who maybe shouldn't have kids having all of the kids. From a pure economical perspective, it's obvious that our old people need people to take care of them and our future generations need kids to pay uh, into the retirement funds right in germany and most of europe it's a pyramid scheme right you always need some young people who are productive who pay for the older people who aren't as productive anymore and typically the older you get the less you're going to be productive right so in the future maybe it's only going to be one adult working taking care of one or two seniors uh, uh, who have to be taken care of right Who's gonna pay for them? Somebody will have to, right? And I know there's gonna be robotics and automation and so on, taking away some of it, but not all of it. There's still gonna be the need for people who not only work and take care of those people and pay for them, but I think especially there's the need for people who have good hearts, who are courageous, who are empathetic, who are brave, who are conscientious, who bring forward our society and our culture, who are funny. And you could very well make the case you owe it to society to bring forward your genes. And the fact that you're even thinking about all of this stuff means you should probably raise kids as well and raise them in a good way because we need your good energy and your good heart in future generations as well. All right, sure. I'm not sure if the genes are so good, but that's another topic and I'm going to talk about this soon. So I would say these are the main reasons that I can think of right now. I'm sure there are many, many more, right? Uh, religious reasons and other, but I'm not that religious and I'm not going to talk so much about this and I want to go over to the cons, which definitely exist as well and which are very prominent as well for me. And keep in mind the cons are abstract and still from my perspective mostly, mostly so they might not apply to you all right let's start with the cons all right number one and this is the obvious one it's incredibly hard to raise 
kids. It's very, very intense talking to friends who now have little infants. The first years are so tough, you don't get any sleep. They're basically small, totally helpless beings who are entirely dependent on you. It takes an immense toll on your health, on your sleep, on your work, on your time. You basically have no time anymore for anything, for your friends. And your relationship is probably going to take a toll, your sex life. All of these things are probably going to suffer. It's incredibly hard. And then after the infancy, you have this phase where they just jump around and hurt themselves. And then you have the phase where they become young adults who have their own issues and maybe mental health problems, health problems. And then when they're teenagers, it can be super tough. Uh, to many, that's the hardest phase where they kind of hate you. And then when they're adults, it can continue being tough, right? Because they don't want to talk to you anymore or they want to leech off of you, whatever. It's very, very tough. Let's be real here, okay? All right. Number two. And this one is maybe a bit egoistical too, but it's very, very expensive. It has become incredibly expensive to raise kids. I mean, back in the day, having nine kids, if you're poor, was possible. But now living in a major city, having nine kids, how are you going to find an apartment that's, uh, that you can afford? It's almost impossible unless you have the luxury of a big welfare state. There are estimates nowadays that kids can easily cost you up to 200, 300, 400,000, right? could be up to a million if you're in the US and if you have to pay for college. Here in Switzerland, sending your kid to daycare can cost two, three thousand a month. And then all the diapers, all the extra food, needing to have a bigger apartment. I mean, the expenses are out of, uh, yeah, incredibly high. Basically, you could buy a house, a nice house in a nice place, a nice beach house. I know you can't compare the two, obviously, but it obviously becomes exponentially more expensive if your kid kind of wants a certain standard of living. If you live in an expensive place like Los Angeles or something, if you're divorced and you need two apartments with an extra room for the kid and so on, it's so incredibly expensive to have kids. Okay, that's for sure. All right. And then... And then number three, I think, is something that kind of worries me too, is the lacking support system, which kind of plays into number one and two. Having a nuclear family is kind of new, right? Back in the day, it was more like intergenerational homes where you would live with your grandparents and maybe your aunts together in one place and everybody can kind of help out. Maybe in Italy or something or in, in the Middle East, it's still the case. But here, not so much, right? And even if you go even more back to the hunter and gatherer days, it basically took a whole tribe to raise a kid. And it was much easier, right? Because everybody shared their duties. The whole village basically took care of the kid. Now this isn't the case anymore. With a nuclear family, you have just you and your partner, and maybe not even your partner, maybe you're a single parent. You have just one or two people taking care of a kid. It's indefinitely more difficult, of course the lacking social support. And the whole society nowadays is built that you you basically have to pay for everything as well because if you have other kids around you, you can share everything. It's also much more expensive. You have to buy everything new instead of taking it used from other people. Uh, you have to spend so much more time and energy and worry on your own kids because nobody else is there, right? You probably have uh, streets around you you can't just let your kids roam around the streets because it's too dangerous. And all of these things contribute to it being much more stressful, much more expensive, much more time consuming, and just a much, much bigger burden on everybody. Okay, that's something I do see as well. And admittedly, my parents don't live nearby. My relatives, I mean, my, my partner's relatives do live nearby, but they're still like an hour away and they probably wouldn't be here all the time and they have their own lives. So it's kind of, 
yeah, you don't really get as much Entlastung as you would say in German, like um, people helping you out and that makes it much more difficult. All right. Then we have number four. Limiting of freedom. To me, my most important first principle, so to say, is free freedom. What I need most in life is freedom for some reason. Having the freedom to maybe move to a different country, having the freedom to work part-time, having the freedom to visit people I want to visit, having the freedom to change careers, having the freedom to have a career which doesn't make much money, All of this is very, very much mitigated and limited by having kids. You can't just do whatever you want to do, right? I mean, me and my partner, we're seriously considering moving to France, maybe, um, living kind of self-sufficiently in a lonely house somewhere. Could we do that if we had a kid? Very difficult, right? Because the kids needs people to play with. It's better if the kid is near to its grandparents. It's better if there's a good school nearby. It's better if the kid has an environment where there's other families and so on. So all of these factors, obviously, then there's, then there's taxes, then there's other factors which play into this. So uh, everything becomes more difficult. And it's 100% sure that you have to accept that you can't really be as free as you want to be. Sure, there are examples of like digital nomads who have kids and, and these people do exist. But what's for sure is that it's much, much more difficult. You have to take a lot of additional variables into consideration. It's going to be more expensive. And maybe that dream that you're having of becoming like, let's say, a diving instructor in, in, in Bali, you can fulfill that. You could, but it's maybe egoistical. It would be fairer for the kid to say, I'm staying in an environment where the kid is going to have the best childhood it possibly can. And this is likely not going to be somewhere in, in Bali or if you want to be like living in a, in a car or something, in an RV, that's probably not ideal for a kid either and so on. All right. And number five also kind of goes hand in hand with number four, the freedom aspect. Kids need constant attention, which, which is fine. I mean, if you neglect your kids, it's child abuse. One of the worst things you can do is just not give attention to your kid, not give love and time to your kid. This is basically inhumane and child abuse. And there are studies that children die if you don't give them any attention and affection. Okay. The problem with me is, with my personality, is I am, I need a lot of time for myself. I need a lot of me time. Um, I have a personality that is very hypersensitive to noises too. And I'm very introverted. And having a kid with a personality that is very loud and just screaming around, I know that it would make me tired, even if it's my kid. And if I'm working intensely on something and if there's my kid jumping around all the time i know that i couldn't be full of love and full of patience i would try of course but i mean just hearing a kid scream in a restaurant makes me kind of furious sure if it's your kid maybe it's different but i know that me having a personality that values me time values my own hobbies values quiet is going to be disrupted by a kid, no matter how quiet the kid is going to be. And I don't want to force my kid into becoming an introvert too. I know that this would be inhumane as well. And I think I'm going to talk a bit more about my personality as well a bit later. All right. Then there is number six. Number six maybe doesn't concern me directly, but still I want to be compassionate. 
I think pregnancy is pretty tough for women. I mean, it's very tough. It's incredibly tough. I mean, the fact that your body completely changes, the fact that your skin changes, the fact that your hormones changes, the fact that you might have postpartum depression, the fact that your libido might tank or go up or whatever. I think men telling women like, I don't care at all, you have to bear children for me, it's very egoistical. And so I have no right to say, I, I command you to have my kid, to bear my kid, because I'm the king of the family. That's a very archaic way of doing this and I don't think like that at all. If my partner said, I don't want to become pregnant because I don't, I want to become a model or something, I would have to accept that, right? Number seven is maybe only semi-serious, but I am honestly a bit annoyed by other parents and kids in many cases. Um, with my sister who was a kid, hanging out at the playground can be pretty tiresome because some parents are just, they always want to start conversations. Then they ask, how old is your kid? Or uh, what's, what's his or her name? And then some people enjoy that type of confrontation or connection that they might make with parents but I necessarily don't in many cases I find other kids pretty tiring tiresome and annoying they're very loud in many instances and very brash and very pity, like petty like no I want to have the candy blah, blah 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 and I think many parents can be insufferable too because they just obviously mistreat their children and they try to train them in a way to become like mini-me's and they want to vicariously live through their kids and I think this is uh, I would find this quite annoying to have to deal with these people and this is maybe kind of a comedic point but I think it's it's a true point it would probably annoy me all right I gotta admit, point number eight is one of the key ones, vulnerability. I think I know that having a kid makes you lose control. And I think I'm, I'm a person who is anxious of losing control. It's something that makes me uncomfortable to a high degree for whatever reason. And I remember even with my little brother, I was always anxious of him being abducted of him being lost and being abducted because I watched too many X-Files or something, but I don't know. But you can't have 100% control with your kid, right? That's, that's for sure. Um, having a kid always means surrendering to uncertainty. There's always a possibility of your kid having birth defects, of your kid having mental health issues, of your kid just dying for some reason, of your kid getting into an accident, which when it happened is must be almost insufferable. It can really crush you for life, I believe. And it could do that for myself. I think in many instances my anxiety would skyrocket because it's just so scary the thought of your kid being out there somewhere without my protection, being mistreated, being bullied somewhere. Um, and I have no control over my kids getting maybe without any fault of my own depressed, getting into an accident, getting hurt. And I would be hurt myself very much as well. And this vulnerability is very, very scary. And I noticed this as, as well. Many new fathers become more conservative because they suddenly want this world to be a safer and a better place, which is good, I think, but it also is scary because you don't necessarily have control over this world. You, you cannot shelter your kids from everything in this life and you shouldn't try to, but there is a very legitimate degree of uncertainty that something really bad is going to happy, happen and you make yourself very, very vulnerable. 
like going to war without any protection or something. It's almost like a suicide mission. It's almost insane to love something so much, hopefully, and then also having no control, really, or little control over how it's going to turn out. This thought to me is very, very scary. All right. Number nine is maybe a bit cynical, but I think to me it's very, very true and dangerous because I've seen this happen many times, I've read about this many times, and I'm sure you also have many couples in your life where this is the case. Kids can trap you into a bad and toxic relationship. There's so many relationships which just persist because of kids, right? Because you know that your kids expect you to stay together, because you know how having divorced parents is not great for the kids and just holding it out for the kids it's so common like having a bad relationship continue um, having a loveless relationship continue having a remorseful and toxic relationship continue just for the sake of kids and honestly I think it's not good in most cases because the kids obviously notice that the kids obviously feel that if you hate each other and I think it's not great for the kids. However, as we have this nuclear family thing going on, it's, it happens so often. And I mean, 50% of, of, of relationships get divorced, right? Or something like that. And uh, I don't know for sure if a relationship is going to last for, forever. And I don't know how it's going to be when you have one or two or three crying kids. Uh, it must be super stressful. And I can't guarantee that the relationship is not going to suffer. Actually, I would make a bet that it's going to suffer intimacy uh, us time it's going to suffer in some form or, or another right I think the idea of being in a very abusive or toxic relationship and having to stay in it is, is very scary to me and especially in the past being a woman you basically had no freedom to go out of it and also as a man you kind of have to stick with it right you could also be in an abusive relationship and I think um, it's better for a kid. All stats basically show that it's better for a kid to have a mother and a father or more caretakers. And single kids, single parent kids perform like exponentially worse, right? But then again, I can't guarantee that a relationship is not going to turn for the worse at some point. And this is why I don't want to be stuck somewhere because as I told you, Freedom is important to me and autonomy and being able to have my hobbies. And if the relationship really turns for the worse, which can happen, or your partner cheats, or your partner suddenly becomes a drug addict or something, or decides that he or she wants to live in a harem or something, then what the hell are you going to do? It's a tough situation to be in and you can't really predict this, right? And it can be very tough also reading on subreddit, uh, dead bedroom, how many couples are just loveless and also sexless. But they kind of accept this life for themselves because they just say, I do it for the kids, which is, I guess, noble in some way, but also just throwing away all of your best years in a way for the kids can definitely happen. And it's very, could happen to myself as well in this situation. I think I would probably stick it out. I don't know. All right, let's maybe talk a bit more about the more abstract ethical questions, which are very interesting and relevant to me as well. And this one is very popular right now, the idea of overpopulation. You shouldn't even have kids because we already have 7 billions of us especially in light with the climate crisis and with pollution and yeah there are articles coming out like you probably shouldn't have a kid if you care for uh, the environment because it's much worse than having a big house and a big car and eating beef all the time 
But frankly, to me, this isn't such a strong argument, not that I don't care for the, uh, the environment, but uh, in all of the Western countries, we already get much less kids. And this problem seems to be solving itself anyways. And also, the world could be having much more people. We could have 10 billion as well. I don't say this would be ideal, but it's also kind of inhumane to say, okay, now the new generations aren't allowed to have kids because I already had mine or whatever. And also, if you look at who gets most kids, it's mostly happening in Africa now. Telling them to not have kids anymore would be pretty dicey from an ethical perspective too. As I said, here in Europe, we already have a catastro uh, catastrophic uh, development of the population and having more kids would actually be good because we need people to take care of the old, we need people to pay for the old. And also I think as we become greener and greener, if we have better technologies, renewable energies, electrical cars, um, less pollution, then having more people wouldn't be such a detriment to the world. And maybe soon we're going to be colonizing Mars, so this problem isn't that pressing anymore, right? So yeah, all right. Number 11, I hear a lot also in the child-free uh, circle, so to say. Uh, which is a valid point, right? Especially with this year and last year with the COVID crisis and who knows when this is going to end. We have climate problems, we have wars just going on right now in Israel and so on. We have so many problems in this world. Uh, corruption, uh, deterioration of mental health, the media is riling people up everywhere and so on and so on. So I think it's reasonable to say, hey, I kind of don't want to bring people into this world. But this also to me isn't really the strongest point personally, because the world isn't as bad as we make it out to be, is, is my opinion. If you read Steven Pinker's book, he basically proves with data, maybe he kind of handpicked it, but still, that with most metrics, be it poverty, famine, death rates, oppression of women, we are making progress, right? And we always think, this is part of the condition humaine, I guess, that we're in the worst time ever. And I guess, honestly, we are doing worse than in the 1960s and 70s. This was a more peaceful and prosperous time. But if we want to build a better future, we need good and healthy kids, that's true. And also, I think people are over-exaggerating how bad it is right now. I think we should be more grateful, and I think we're still in a good, healthy time. There are very bad trends and tendencies, and censorship, and polarization, and right-wing problems, left-wing problems, radicalization, viruses, being careless, many, many problems with pollution and so on. But I don't think the world is too terrible to bring a kid into this world. However, coming to point 12, I do think a lot about the ethics in general, about bringing life into this world, about the ethics of consent, which is a very important principle and right, I would say. In the anti-natalist circles, the main argument is that you never gave consent to be brought into this life. And if we say that the suffering outweighs the joy you could have in life, then it is kind of like ethically questionable at least to just say, yeah, I'm just going to bring this life into this world without ever asking this being if he or she wants to be born. And if you think of, let's say, mass-produced animals, it's more obvious, right? There it's pretty obvious that it's unethical to just bring a small uh, sheep into this world or a cow. 
or even worse, like a small um, chicken, just feed it with bad food, uh, have it live in a small cage and then just slaughter it. You never asked for, I mean, this, this animal doesn't have a great life, you could obviously say, and this animal never asked to be brought into this world. And these animals do suffer from pain and do have emotions and do have bonds to their peers. And I think there it's easier for us to say, no, it's, it's not right to bring these people into this world. If you look at humans, it's a bit more, uh, it's not as black and white, obviously, it's more of a gray zone, but I think there is a case to be made for the point that there is too much suffering in this life and in this world for it to be ethical to bring people into it. It's not right. You shouldn't do it. Especially if you consider kids who have birth defects, who have mental illnesses, who are very ugly, who have big scars, who are just uh, have disabilities, who never will experience the full breath of joy of, of being loved and being uh, cared for, who always be, will be ridiculed, who get born into terrible circumstances. I think there's definitely a case to be made to say it's inhumane to bring kids into this world because you have some advantages from it, because you want to maybe have a slave, kind of like a slave who takes care of you, or you want to have some workforce, you want to continue your lineage, you want to... Uh, all these pros I mentioned before, all of these become very egoistical if you look at all the pain that this kid might be having later on in life. <laughs> this sounds kind of cynical and maybe hard to swallow for many parents, but yeah, there is a case to be made for that, I think. And there are books about this as well from some author. I don't know exactly who it is right now. A kid never really gave consent if he or she wanted to be born into this world, right? There's definitely a case to be made. And uh, what usually people reply when being asked this or when being confronted with this information is, but, but you like to be alive, right? And a lot of people say will say yes, but a lot of people, if they're really honest and if they maybe had one or two beers, they kind of say, mm, it's kind of overrated living, being alive. Some stuff is kind of nice, but I only kind of like being on drugs or something. <laughs> this is pretty dark, but it's, it's kind of true. So I think the ethics of bringing something into life without asking for consent is, uh, you can definitely make a case for it being inhumane and being egoistical and being narcissistic even almost because you want to have your mini me you want to create your new me you want to conserve your dna and you don't really care about all the effed up genes you're giving to that person all right Then maybe going back a bit more to myself, but these may be the most important two points. Number 13, I think I will screw up my kids. No matter how good I am, no matter how many books I'm gonna read, I know that I'm gonna in some way or another screw up my kids. Um, I can read all the books in this world and be perfectly prepared, prepared and always be patient and always be nice. In some way, I'm sure I'm going to damage my kids because just sometimes I'm going to be impatient. Sometimes I'm not going to be the best dad possible. Maybe I'm going to give him too much time. Maybe I'm going to overburden him with my love. Um, maybe none of that is true, but just by coincidence, I'm going to get them into situations, into a school where he gets bullied or she, or I'm going to bring him to music classes where he's gonna develop some kind of trauma from. I know that no matter how hard I try, I'm gonna screw up my kids. And because we all have, have our implicit biases, our quirks, I have my hypersensitivity and probably some ADHD and so on, which is gonna in some way negatively affect my kid, I'm sure. And if not by the way I treat him, by my genes. And I would say this is the final point, Number 14. Okay. My 
jeans. I'm not sure if I want to pass on my jeans. That's probably the main summary of this video in total. I'm not sure if my jeans are that great. Most people are have some kind of hybris when it comes to their jeans. They think they're better than average. And I think when it comes to certain traits, I am, I guess, higher than average. But I'm also worse than average in very significant ones. And I'm going to talk about this later too, maybe. It's a bit personal. But most people don't even think about this. They're way too self-absorbed. They want to have this mini-me. They thought it's kind of fun and it's maybe the right thing to do. They don't think about how, to what extent, the genes are going to be passed on. It's uh, Right now, the, the scientific community says it's 50% genes are going to be passed on, but it might be more when you, favor, when you factor in the indirect effects on your genes, how you're going to raise them because of your genes. So it might be more like 70% all in all if you sum it up. And uh, it's, it's, it's dangerous. Um, I don't understand how people who have severe schizophrenia or depression bring p humans into this world. I don't get it. I think it's unethical. I do get it. I do understand it from a, a psychological perspective, but I think it's still a weird thing to do. And you could say, we humans, we are imperfect. It's just the way we are. That's nice. But um, I don't want to burden my kid with suboptimal genes. Is the solution gene editing with CRISPR? I don't know. I think in, f in the future, kids are going to be brought to life like this. I'm quite convinced about it. But as of now, I know that my genes are going to lead to some suffering down the line. I'm sure of it. All right, I'm gonna, I think, put this here, my nice pros and cons list. I like to make those, but I want to try to make a summary. Do I have more clarity now? Hmm, it's hard. It's a very tough question, right? One thing I'm quite sure of is that we vastly underestimate to what extent our lives will change once we have kids. We can't even fathom how much it's going to change. Not only the time it's going to take, the resource investment, the money investment, but mostly how your perspective on this world is going to change. How you're going to see the world with different eyes because you have a small person that you're responsible for, that you brought into this life. I think we vastly underestimate it. And this could be in a way also seen as a pro argument as basically saying you can't even say or you can't even talk about this topic because you haven't experienced it it's kind of like saying you can't understand how it is to be the victim of race and racism because you've never been the victim of racism because you've been privileged in this way and this way you can't even understand it conversely you could say being a parent you can't even understand how difficult it is, but also how uh, rewarding it can technically be. And I think if I take all my pros and cons, the most significant pro for me is really that curiosity aspect. The fact that I don't know how it's going to be. I'm very curious how it would feel like. I'm very curious to see a small being growing up and frankly to experiencing some of the joy of it would be quite beautiful to see it grow up to spend a lot of time with it to give shower it with love and, and and time and to be honest and that's quite egoistical i kind of want to play some pokemon with with, with a kid hopefully he or she would love it but then again on the con side this big uncertainty this huge vulnerability of not knowing if the kid is even going to be happy, not knowing if I'm going to do a good job at it. Uh, I'm not even so much, I don't really care about the money and the time that I'm going to be losing so much. I think I wouldn't feel that way. I think I could be liking the role of being a dad. But I also see how it could potentially be 
difficult for me as well with the personality I have um, to just be patient enough to just not be uh, this hypersensitivity I have uh, I won't be able to turn it off I think maybe going back to the Jordan Peterson clip I showed initially I want to show you the rest of it which was I think quite interesting you know I mean there aren't that many things that make up your life and intimate relationships that's 20% of your life or 30% of your life. Children, that's 20% of your life. Now, you can get away with neither of those, but you better have a walloping career or a tremendous aptitude at something creative and remarkable. And maybe you can do that. Maybe that'll be enough for you. But I've seen that unidimensionality work out well and very, 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 very rarely. So, and you have children because you won't have... You'll never have the opportunity in your life to have as high quality a relationship with anyone as you could potentially have with your child. So you're going to forego that? Well, you can, but what's left for you then? All this cynicism. And yeah, I got to say the points that Jordan Peterson mentions here are valid. Namely that uh, the relationship you could technically build with your kid could really be unique and deeper than anything you have built before. That's definitely true. And also, secondly, that what else are you going to do? That sounds kind of dumb, right? But approaching your 30s, you notice I did most things and they don't, they're nice. Most, most things like traveling or having sex or spending money, they're kind of nice, but there's got to be more to life, right? And this is probably the main reason why people have kids at some point. And as, as Peterson says, you got to really have a strong and rewarding career or a great artistic hobbies or things that really can capture your attention for you to not long for something else. I think that's very much true. However, I do think for me personally, I could have a good life and fill it up with great things without getting bored easily. I'm quite confident in this regard, and my partner could as well. And secondly, uh, and this is going to be maybe a bit mean, and I don't want to shit on Peterson because I value him and his ideas. Uh, the fact that he's almost crying in this interview again, I think it's good for men to be emotional. I think we shouldn't be making fun of this at all, but in most of his interviews lately, he's been starting to cry at some point and getting very emotional. Just taking his example, I mean, he has two kids, or three, but he still got addicted to opiates and so on, and he's very depressed and so on, so uh, it, it didn't change his life completely, but that's not empirically valid, of course. But even looking at his own daughter, Michaela Peterson, she struggled her whole life with very severe depression, but also very severe um, immune problems, which forced her to eat like a carnivore diet and arthritis and very, very painful ailments where she has to get hip surgery all the time. And now she has to take care of her father, which was in a co who was in a coma, had to bring him to Russia and so on. And so one has to ask, like, was it ethically correct to bring someone into this life having the genes of Jordan Peterson. Because Jordan is susceptible to depression, he is susceptible to um, overthinking and, and, and he does have some autoimmune problems. And his daughter has the same. So uh, I would probably bet that his daughter still sees life as a net positive. I don't know, I would have to ask her and interview her. And if you listen to this by any chance, feel free to chime in. Michaela Peterson, but this is exactly my fear. It's not evident to me that it's the right and ethical and loving thing to do to bring life into this world. If you know there's a very good chance that they're going to suffer from your genetic problems. And this is, I think, the point where I can get a bit personal and I'm going to only post this part on Patreon because I think it's a bit too personal for YouTube. This was my longer than expected rant about children or not. It's a very 
prominent topic nowadays. I think it's wrong to, I think that's my main takeaway for myself. I think it's generally wrong for us to coerce people into either getting kids or not getting kids. I see both happening. Mostly it's getting kids, right? Those tradcon people or religious people telling their kids, you must continue the lineage. You have to give me, schenk me einen Sohn, as, as we say in German, give me a son. Especially in Muslim families, you have to get a son uh, for you to continue the patriarch tradition of your somewhat backwards religion. And uh, the same goes for many Christians and evangelical Christians, where it's very important to have kids. That's wrong. But I think in many cities, from my friends, I hear that in Berlin and so on, it's actually almost you have to justify yourself to having kids. It's like people look at you like, why do you have kids in this world, in this environment, in this economy, with this global uh, climate crisis? I think that's wrong too, and it's uneducated, and it's nonsensical, because we can have more kids. We, we need good kids, I guess, in some way. Maybe in the future we won't anymore. We're going to have robots. And I do very much suspect that we're going to have um, kids coming out of the lab, basically, with gene editing. We're going to have smart and intelligent kids. We technically can do that to some extent already. And I do think that having actual sex and living in nuclear families is going to be a thing of the past. It's going to be more like Brave New World. I do believe that quite uh, to a quite high, high certainty this is going to happen. But if you already have kids, then congrats and good for you. And I, I didn't want to discourage you in any way. I think it's beautiful. And you do a very important job and a difficult job as well. And I have a lot of respect for you. If you choose to remain childless, I also have a lot of respect for you. And I, I explain to you why I'm very similar to you probably and why I, there's a very good chance that I might remain childless as well. There is a part of me that thinks I might be missing out on a very important experience in life, which might be more difficult than it is rewarding. I don't know, but it is an experience in life and I want to experience it, okay? And the idea of being a better father, of giving a lot of love and understanding and not trying to create a mini-me, create a version of a kid that I want to have, but just leave the kid be as it wants to be. I think that's compelling to me and gives me a nice feeling and being able to play some board games with the kids is also a nice idea. But I don't know. I don't know what the future is going to bring and it also very much depends on my partner who doesn't have at least one bit babies, rabies. And it's not even going to be clear if we're able to have kids. That's another point. And there's the whole question of the genes and if I want my genes to be passed on because I'm not as narcissistic and uh, arrogant to say my genes are the best. They have to continue and I want my family to, I want my family name to continue on this world. I don't really care. And maybe we're just going to be dog moms or whatever and we're going to be super annoying and then we want people to give us mother's day presents because we are dog moms or cat moms and fathers i don't know all right i'd be interested to hear your perspective uh, i probably forget some pros and cons because those were the ones that came to my mind and were the most pressing to me but i do acknowledge that thousands of others could be found I think it was freeing to, to have this little therapy session with you. Thank you so much for spending this time uh, with me.